we're starting a brand new way of teaching at the feast. We're starting something exciting. God is birthing a whole new generation of people who will hunger to follow the word. By book, verse by verse, chapter by chapter, story by story. We're gonna sit at the master's feet with total humility and allow the text as divinely inspired to speak to our hearts. Get ready because we're gonna start this journey of longing and really understanding God and His Word for you. Let me invite you to say our favorite prayer here at the feast. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Everybody stretch out your hands and say this with me. Today, I receive all of God's love for me. Come on. Today, I open myself to the unbounded, limitless, overflowing abundance of God's universe. Today, I open myself to God's blessings healing and miracles. Today I open myself to God's Word so that I become more like Jesus every day. Today I proclaim that I'm God's beloved. I'm God's servant. Shout it out! And because I am blessed, I am blessing the world. In Jesus' name, amen. Everybody extend your hands in honor of God's Word. Let's sing together. Thy Word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path our talk title for today you are absolutely gonna love this here it is word war three everybody say word war three i'm not saying world war that's a different word i'm saying word war three and the number three will actually have a significance later on that brother bo is going to preach to you but let's go to our verse for today from matthew chapter 4 verse 1. we're going to put it up on the screen help me read it ready set go then jesus was led by the spirit into the wilderness to be tempted there by the devil for 40 days and 40 nights he fasted and became very hungry during that time, the devil came and said to him, If you are the Son of God, tell these stones to become loaves of bread. But Jesus told him, No, the scriptures say, People do not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Quickly tell the person beside you, Wakang puro tinapay lang, ha? Okay, let's continue. Verse 5. Again, it says, Then the devil took him to the holy city, Jerusalem to the highest point of the temple and he said if you are the son of God jump off for the scriptures say he will order his angels to protect you and then he will hold you up with their hands so you won't even hurt your foot on a stone but then Jesus responded he said the scriptures also say you must not test the Lord your God next the devil took him to the peak of a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. I will give all to you, he said, if you will kneel down and worship me. And then he said, get out of here, Satan. Can you shout that? Get out of here, Satan, Jesus told him. For the scriptures say, you must worship the Lord your God and serve only him. Then the devil went away and angels came and took care of Jesus. Here's our big message for you for today. Are you ready for this message? I want you to know that you are a God follower. You're a God follower. You're a God follower. Tell somebody beside you, you're a God follower. Amen. 
Let's pray. Father, this is your word. Sometimes we don't understand it. Sometimes it's so deep. It's so incomprehensible. But that's why we need the power of the Holy Spirit to speak to us, to decipher this for us. Let it be said in a language so simple and so practical that we will know at the end of the day how to be able to apply this in our life. We are limited, Lord, by our capacities. But with you on our side, with you helping us, Lord, we are unstoppable for the grace of God. So thank you for what you are going to do today. Father, we thank you for sending us in this place. It's not an accident that we're standing right before your presence. So speak to us in a way that we will understand. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. One more time, everybody. Lay your hands and let's sing. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. You know, when I, every time I talk about the devil, I get two reactions. Two. First reaction is, you still believe that there is such a thing as the devil? You know, the guy in the red suit with the pointy tail and the pointy ears and the fangs and the pitchfork? You still believe in that? at a time when there are, you know, in the modern age of computers and phones and you still believe in the devil? Here's my answer. What's my answer? Ask me what? Yes, I do. I do believe. But who says, here's my question. Who says the devil is in a red suit with a pointy tail, with pointy ears, with fangs, and a pitchfork? Who says that picture, everybody say picture, does not come from the Bible. Does that shock you? That picture comes more from 14th century Dante Alighieri's Divine Comedy and 17th century John Milton's Lost Paradise. That's where it comes from. Are you listening to what I'm saying? All through that Bible, you know, angels and demons, they don't even have wings in the Bible. Do you, is that shocking to you? Every picture that you see in your mind or even in movies and, and, and books, you know, angels have wings. Where does that come from? Not from the Bible. You see, when you think of the devil in that, you know, red suit, pointy tail, pointy ears, you know, when you think of that picture, you will not get the main message of what the Bible is trying to tell you about the devil. And, and that's why we need to edit. Everybody say edit. We need to edit that in our minds. You know, we don't even want to mention the word devil. <laughs> it's like, Ugh, you know. But uh, especially Satan. You know? don't, don't, don't say his name. It's like you're calling him. No. In fact, biblically, the word Satan is not a proper name. It's not a first name. It, it's simply a title. In Greek, it's adversary or enemy. So, so I, I just want to say, I just want to say this. Uh, first reaction is, is there really still a devil? You know, in this modern age of, and, and my answer is yes, but we need to edit our pictures in our minds because they're not helpful. Am I making sense to you? What does the Bible say? Ask me what? Complete sentence. What does the Bible say? Evil exists. Evil is real. Evil is around us. In fact, all you have to do is look out of the window and you'll see evil. When I see a seven-year-old street kid sniffing rugby on the sidewalk, whatever made that happen is evil. We have two ministries for abused children. Jeremiah is one of them. Many years ago, we started this home and we welcome kids. 14 years old, 13 years old, 12 years old, raped by the very men who are supposed to protect them. Fathers, uncles, brothers, grandfathers. What do you call that? Sick and evil. Am I making sense to you? You know, this is evil. You know, Transparency International would say that there are 60 to 100,000 children trapped now in prostitution some of those children sold by their own parents. That is horrible, that is evil. Poverty is evil, yes or no? Corruption is evil, yes or no? Companies, corporations exploiting their employees, 
evil. Go to history. One million uh, Tutsis, one million Tutsis massacred in the Rwanda genocide. Two million people massacred in Cambodia and the Khmer Rouge regime. Six million Jews, you know that, killed at the time of Hitler. 60 million to 75 million people died in World War II. That is evil. You don't even have to go far away when you, when you think about evil. Let's go to a personal level. May I? Adultery is evil. Millions of children right now suffering in pain because of adultery. Because someone, the father, did not use his brain in his decision making. He used his hormones. Am I making sense? This is evil. I just want to say that to you. You know, to people who say, ah, oh, there's, there's still devil. There's, there, there is, there is. Just look. And all this evil that I mentioned, it cannot be explained just by human weakness. You go through the Bible, and the Bible claims that there is this spiritual, personal evil that's, ha that, that's there in the world. Now, there's another reaction, opposite reaction, opposite pendulum reaction. Devil? Yes. The devil is everywhere. After the feast, man comes up to me. Brother Bo, I, I, I almost did not attend the, fe the feast because this morning I was starting the car, did not want to start. Demonio talaga. You're like, maybe, maybe not, you know. I wanted to ask him, when was the last time you replaced the battery? I'm not a car expert, but am I right? Every two or three years, you've got to change that thing? The opposite reaction is we believe the devil is everywhere. You know, they see the devil behind people they don't like. They, they, they see the devil behind every problem. And, and here's the thing. Here's the problem. Ask me what? It will be so easy to excuse and blame the devil for everything. Twelve time a, times a day you will say, the devil made me do it. I know this couple. Years and years ago. Guy comes up to me. The husband. Brother Bo. Can you pray for my wife? I, you know, when she gets angry at me, she looks like she's demon-possessed. My gosh, her face contorts, distorts. You know, it's horrible. As though she has fangs when she gets angry at me. And, and you know what, what I imagine, Brother Bo? Yung pelikula ng exorcist. Yung her, her head, kulang na lang yun, 360 degrees na umiikot. You know, I, I'm so scared when my, when my wife gets... And I pitied the guy. I said, wow, you've got... You go through this? You know what? Yes, she's angry at me every day. Wow. A few weeks later, I meet the wife. You know, I have a very interesting life. I tell you, I mean, being a preacher, you know, love it. You know, never bored. The wife comes up to me. You know, you know what she said? Brother Bo... Can you pray for my husband? And then, and then I was shocked by what she told me. I was shocked because I knew them, okay? I knew them, and, and I was shocked. She said, my husband is having an affair with his office mate. Question, who is really demon-possessed? Husband or wife? You got what I'm saying? But the husband, you know, he looks at the face of his wife. It's, you know, the devil is there. But he does not understand that the affair, that's where the devil is. Am I speaking to somebody in this room? We need to see that the main way by which the devil destroys our lives is not through some paranormal, you know. No, the devil destroys our lives mainly through sin. Because when we sin, we fall away from the grace of God. So, talking about this, I, I just want to say let's delete whatever Hollywood picture we have about the devil so that we understand the Bible. We start with verse 1. Open your Bibles, chapter 4, Gospel of Matthew. Then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted there by the devil. Read, to, read with me again. Then Jesus was led by the Spirit. Who led Jesus? The Spirit into the wilderness. If you have your Bible with you, underline the, or encircle the word led by the Spirit. How awful! 
I thought it's Psalms 23. The Lord is my shepherd. He will lead me to green pastures. He will let me lie down beside still waters. But no, the Spirit led Jesus to the wilderness. Everybody say wilderness. Wilderness means desert. Now, Filipinos, you and I, we don't know what deserts are. You know, we, we don't have deserts. Maybe we have one in Ilocos, but we don't have deserts. But I'll give you the core characteristic of desert. Desert is a lack. Everybody say lack. A lack of resources, lack of food, lack, lack of water. Even if you, you and I, we, we, don't, we don't know what desert is. You and I, we've been to deserts, quote unquote, in our life. Emotional deserts, spiritual deserts. We have. How many of you have experienced lack in your life? Raise your hand. Now, you know, you know why you went through that lack? Ask me why. Maybe sickness, maybe financial bankruptcy, may, may, maybe it's a conflict, you know, and, and, and it was painful and it was difficult. Again, ask me why. Why did you go through that desert? Number one, might be your fault. It's true, might be. Number two, might not be your fault. Might be because of you live in a broken world. And we live in a broken world, and, and there are deserts, and you go through them. But here's number three. Ask me what's number three. God may have led you to that desert. Ask me why. Because the pain is preparing you for his purpose. That's why. Because spiritual growth happens, not in good times, but in bad times. And the reason why you're going through your bad times is because God is causing spiritual growth. He's steering it up because character is formed only through crisis. Do I hear a loud amen? Verse two, for 40 days and nights, he fasted and became hungry. If you have your Bible in front of you, underline or encircle the word 40. 40, everybody say 40. Why 40? Why not 38? Why not 12? Why not 86? Why 40? Ask me why 40? Because Noah, you go through the Bible, there's, there's, there's 40 all over the place. Noah was in the ark with the flood waters for 40 days and nights. Moses was up there in Mount Sinai for 40 days and nights. Israel from Egypt traveled for 40 years. Why 40? Ask me why 40? How many of you have ever been pregnant? Raise your hand. Thank God I've never been pregnant. But those who raise their hand, how many weeks before the baby comes out? 40 weeks. And so what the Bible is trying to say is that something good is going to come out after 40. Pregnancy is a difficult time. I've never been pregnant, but I see pregnant women. They have difficult times. It's difficult to be pregnant. But then but joy comes out after 40. You are going to go through some testing in your life. You're going to go through your 40 days. But I want you to believe that if you're faithful, you're going to come out as a new baby. The baby is you, a new person. Yes, you don't believe me. But that's, that's what's happening here. And so we move to, to, the, to the very temptation. And the temptation are three temptations, three tests. And so here's the first one, verse 3. During that time, the devil came and said to him, If you are the Son of God, tell these stones to become loaves of bread. But Jesus told him, no, the scripture says people do not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. The first temptation is the temptation of materialism. Say materialism. That Jesus had a need, and it was hunger, and he needed bread, and the devil said, you know, why don't you just make bread? And what was happening is this, make material things your first priority. That was the temptation. It's it's. Things before anything else. Money before anything. Do you want to be happy? The devil is saying, do you want to be happy? The answer is material things. That's the temptation. You want to be happy? Have money. You know what Jesus says? Ask me what? Don't even seek for happiness. Seek the kingdom of God first. And all things will be added unto you. Tell somebody beside you, people before things. 
people before things. One more time, everybody say people before things. The devil will tell you things before people. But you, you know this. It's always people before things. Say amen. Oh, I love this word. And then the second temptation is this. Let's go to verse 5. Then the devil took him to the holy city, Jerusalem, to the highest point in the temple. Uh, maybe not physical. Oh, by the way, can, can, I, can, I, can I insert this point? That this whole story of the temptation of Jesus is so unique. Ask me why. Because all the other events of the life of Jesus found in the gospel, there were eyewitnesses. He heals a sick person. There were people who could see. He multiplies bread. People saw. Thousands of people were eating. Uh, he died on the cross. People saw. He rose from the dead. There were eyewitnesses. The devil tempting Jesus. Who, who was the eyewitness? Was somebody there? Oh, look, a devil and Jesus taking down notes. Was, was somebody there? Answer me. No. Then why do we know? What, how, how did Matthew write the story? Ask me how. Jesus told him. Jesus, he said to himself, probably, I'm thinking, I'm guessing, that this story of the devil tempting him was so important and so useful, he felt it was important enough to tell his disciples. And when he told his disciples, the reason why he told that story, ask me why? Because he knew that we also will be going through tests. And he wanted to tell us, this is how you fight the enemy. This is how. So we go to temptation number two, test number two. Then the devil took him to the holy city, Jerusalem, to the highest point in the temple. Now, probably this didn't happen physically. This, this is more like Thanos. It's Thanos giving a virtual reality vision to Star-Lord. Sorry, I'm a Marvel fan, so... Uh, so he, and, then, and then he says this, the devil says this, if you are the son of God, jump off. For the scripture says, he will order his angels to protect you and they will hold you up with their hands so you won't even hurt your foot on a stone. How dare the devil quotes the Bible. Isn't that horrible? The devil quotes the Bible, which goes to show it does not mean that anyone who quotes the Bible is on the side of God. Because the devil, I'm telling you, has memorized the Bible in every language, in every, in every version. How dare the devil quotes Psalms 91. I love Psalm 91. I pray, I, I pray Psalm 91. But that's what the devil did. But do you know what Jesus did? Ask me what? He quotes another Bible verse. And Jesus responded. The scripture also says, you must not test the Lord your God. That comes from Deuteronomy chapter 6. You want to go there? Go back to the Old Testament. If you have your Bibles, go to the, the fifth book of the Old Testament. Deuteronomy 6 verse 16 says, together, you must not test the Lord your God. That's what Jesus was quoting. And then it's, you have, so you have to complete the whole verse because that's not anywhere found in Matthew 4. As you did when you complained in Massa. To understand what was the second temptation all about, you've got to go through those verses. And so at Massa, what happened in Massa? This was referring to Exodus 17 verse 7 onwards. So go there. I won't, I won't bring you there anymore, but I'll tell you the story. This was a time when the Israelites were traveling to the wilderness, the desert, and they had no water. And then they said, oh, why did, we, why, why, why did you save us? Why did you bring us out of Egypt? And they complained and they rebelled. Do you know what the second temptation is of the devil? To play God. To play God. To make God your secretary. It's making God your genie. Rubbing the lamp. The second temptation is to focus on what? On God fulfilling your wishes instead of you fulfilling the wishes of God. We do that. We, we, we want God to be our secretary. We, we want God to, to do this. Or else, if you don't do that, Lord, I rebel. I quit. That's the second temptation. And that's a very real temptation. 
We want God to be our vendor machine. We want God to be our Santa Claus. We, we want God to, you know, do our bidding instead of coming before him in humility and saying, Lord, you know, I've got needs and I want you to bless me. But that's not the most important thing. The most important thing is that I seek you first. And sure, all things will be added unto me, but it's you first. You're, 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 you're my king. You're my Lord. Let's go to temptation number three. The test number three. Let's go back to Matthew chapter four. Next, the devil took him to the peak of a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. So this is probably another virtual reality vision that, that the devil was giving Jesus. In verse nine, the devil says, I will give it all to you. And if you kneel down, he said, if you kneel down and worship me. Do you know what the third temptation is? Ask me what? To skip the cross. You see, Jesus knew he was going to die. He was going to get crucified. He was going to die. He's going to be raised to life. And Jesus knew he was going to receive all the glory at the end. But you know what the devil was offering him? Jesus, you're going to go through the cross to get the glory? I, I can give you the glory now. All you'd have to do is bow. Well, hey, I'm not a very demanding man. You know, just genuflect with one knee. That's fine. And if you do that, I'll give you all the glory. Why go through the cross? All that blood. Yuck. You know? Come. That's the third temptation. That's the third test. And mind you, I want you to know it happens every day. We are always tempted to skip the cross. How many of you want to earn money? Raise your hand. Parang konti lang. You want to earn money? Yes. But what's the temptation? To do it in a hurry. To steal. To cheat. You skip the cross. And, but when you do that, you're going to be destroyed. Am I making sense to you? Basically this. The third temptation is the devil telling you, make an immoral shortcut. Not all shortcuts are wrong. But there are shortcuts that are wrong. And the devil says, take it, take it. How many of you want to have a fantastic marriage? You want to have a fantastic marriage? You, you, you've got to go to the cross. You've got to die a thousand deaths. Right now, if you have a fantastic, I have a fantastic marriage. And I'm telling you, the reason why it's fantastic is because I and my wife have died a thousand deaths. Dying to ourselves, sacrificing, being selfless. Am I, am I speaking to you? But the way, so, so the way to a great marriage is through the cross. And the devil is saying, oh, you can have a great marriage without the cross. Do some immoral shortcuts, you know. And, and, and the way to do that is, no, no, you, you've got, and, and so, so be selfish. So will you ever reach there? No, you won't. But that's, that's what the devil wants you to do. You'll still have the joy. You'll still have the excitement. How? Well, well, if it's not, it's, if it's not going to be with your wife, then might as well get this other girl because you're going to have a lot of fun. And, and it's going to be exciting. And she's brand new. And she's younger. And, and so, not through the cross. Am I speaking to somebody here? The reason why I believe this interpretation is right about the third test is because, listen to what Jesus said, verse 10. Get out of here, Satan, Jesus told him. For the scripture says you must worship the Lord your God and serve only him. Get out of here, Satan. That's what Jesus said. When, 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 where else did Jesus say that? Ask me where. Twelve chapters later, chapter 16, he was with his apostles. Jesus started talking about his death, predicting about his suffering. And then Peter said, let's, let's look at that, chapter 16, verse 22. Go, go there. Peter says, heaven forbid, Lord, he said. This will never happen to you. Jesus turned to Peter and said, Get away from me, Satan. You are a dangerous trap to me. You're seeing things merely from a human point of view, not from God's. Separated by 12 chapters. Chapter 4, chapter 16. Chapter 4, the devil says, Worship me. Jesus says, Get away from me, Satan. Chapter 16. Peter says, Don't, don't go to the cross. Don't, don't die. You know, Messiah's shouldn't die. Messiah should conquer. Messiah's, you know, a, a dead Messiah is a failed Messiah. No, no, you have to kick the Romans out of the land of Israel. Jesus, what are you talking about dying and suffering? 
And what did Jesus say? Get away from me, Satan. The same words. Matthew 4, Matthew 16. Matthew was, was tying them together, and he was telling you, this is the third temptation, to skip the cross. <clears throat> I love, I love the word. As we're talking about temptation, I thought it would be best that we close our session today by letting me teach you just a little something of how temptation begins or, or how does temptation start? Would you like to know this? Is this something you'd like to learn? Okay. We go back to the scripture that we have been reading. It says here in Matthew chapter 4 verse 1, then the Spirit, where is it? Then Jesus was led by the Spirit. Everybody say, He was led by the Spirit. He was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted there by the devil. You see, that's true. Sometimes God will allow you to be tested, to be tried, to, to go through trials. Why? Because He wants to teach you something. Because God wants you to know that He can produce purpose even out of pain. He can produce strength even out of struggle. And so that's what we see here, that it was the Spirit that led Jesus into the wilderness to be tempted. But here in verse 2, this gives us a clue on how temptation begins, okay? Very clear. It says here, For 40 days and 40 nights, he fasted and became very hungry. Everybody say, he became very hungry. And then verse 3 says, During that time, the devil came. So if you read this text alone, it would seem that the Bible is implying that the reason why Jesus was even being tempted was number one, because the Spirit led him there. But here's the second thing. It was because he became very hungry. One more time, everybody say, he became very hungry. Let me tell you the truth. The starting point of temptation oftentimes starts when you're hungry. The devil loves it when you get hungry. Why? Because when you're starving, you don't have the strength to fight temptation. Let me prove it to you, all right? Just by a raise of hands. How many of you here would agree with me that the worst time for you to go grocery shopping is on an empty stomach? Raise your hand. Yes? If you raised your hand, you know what it's like to lose some money buying those groceries that you know you will never touch. But you only bought it because you had an empty stomach. You thought you were going to be able to eat the entire aisle in that section in the grocery simply because you were hungry, right? Same thing goes when you go to a restaurant on an empty stomach. Dangerous thing to do, by the way. Because when you're so hungry, you look at that menu, you call the waiter and you say, Sir, I'd like to order page one and page two. Instead of just ordering one item, you order the entire page simply because you're hungry. When you're hungry, you know you're not thinking properly because you're not thinking from your head and your heart. You're thinking from your hunger. And that's a dangerous place to be in when you think from your desires, when you let your desires rule over you. All the single people here, raise your hand if you're single. I want to speak to you for a moment. When you are so hungry for love, for example, when you're so desperate for love, you know what you're going to do? You're going to be willing to receive love even if it comes from the wrong place and the wrong person. Can I get an amen? Pinansin ka lang, crush mo na. Kinausap ka lang ng isang minuto, mahal mo na. Ano yan? Minute to win it? You know, love is not a game show and married people know this. Love is more like a reality show, right? With a lot of action, a lot of, of comedy, a lot of romance, and oftentimes a lot of horror and, and drama. Can I get an amen from the married people? Amen. You got to remember that, that, you know, when you're hungry, you don't have the strength to fight off and resist temptation. And let me repeat to you our message last week. We said this last week. You got to listen to this if you weren't here last Sunday. We said, every temptation is a temptation for you to do two things. Number one, it's a temptation for you to doubt God's love for you. And the second is, it's a temptation for you to doubt your identity in Christ. In other words, the devil wants you to doubt God's love for you. He wants you to question, does God really love me? Is God really for me? And the second thing is he wants you to doubt who you are in Christ, who is in you, who died for you. Because he knows that when he's able to stop you from believing in your identity, he can stop you from doing big things for God. That's the truth. Because he knows there is a direct link between your identity and your activity. And if he can stop you from believing your identity, he can stop you from fulfilling your destiny. Because here's the truth. You act 
according to who you think you are. You act according to who you think you are. For example, if you think that you are kind, more often than not, you'll be kind, right? If you think that you're patient, more often than not, you'll be patient. If you think you're faithful, more often than not, you'll, you'll be faithful. If you think you're attractive, more often than not, you're delirious. <laughs> Just kidding on that one. But yeah, that's the truth. If you think you're attractive, you'll start behaving and acting like an attractive person. Because you act according to who you think you are. That's why never ever say, I'm a bad person. Or I'm a weak person. Or I'm a hopeless person. Because the last time I checked, the Bible says that when God created you and me, He said, it was very good. Can you look at your neighbor and check if that person looks really good? That's the truth. So don't ever say, I'm a bad person. You might have done some bad things, but it doesn't mean you're a bad person. You've just forgotten how to be good. So never ever forget your, your, who you are in Christ also. Never doubt your identity in God. Because here's the truth. When you start doubting your identity, you'll also start doubting your capacity. All of a sudden, you won't be able to do what God wants you to do. You won't be able to serve the way God wants you to serve. You won't be able to love the way God wants you to love. So two things of how temptation will get you, but it begins when you're hungry. Are we clear on this point? Okay, I'm going to close, but I need you to stand up. Can you jump up to your feet? I want to share with you a practical illustration of, of something that I think would really help us as we move forward. When you recognize temptation coming in your house or trying to knock on your door, here's a practical step that you can do, okay? I'm going to share this in light of what my mom and sister does. You see, my mom and my sister are both vegetarians. How many here are vegetarians? Raise your hand. Are there any vegetarians here? We got a couple here. Very good, very good. Beautiful lifestyle, by the way. So my mom and my sister are both vegetarians, right? They have been vegetarians for at least maybe 12 years, give or take. And when they were starting out, they had a struggle. They had a very big struggle. Because you see, if you are a vegetarian, or even more, if you are vegan, you don't eat dairy, you would know that you would have very limited options in terms of where you can go to eat. Right? Because not every restaurant would serve the kind of food that you want. And specifically for vegans, they have a very specific type of food, type of ingredient, the way they cook it. So it's very hard. But the one thing that I noticed with my mom and sister is that they struggled the most during the time when they were starting out. Whenever they would get invited to an event or a party or a gathering, it was so, it was so hard for them. Because not every event that they would come would serve the right kind of food that they would want to eat. Until one day, they came up with a beautiful practical solution to this. They realized that the only way they would end up with a full stomach is that before they would go to the actual event, here's what they would do. They would eat at home. They would stuff themselves with the right kind of food that they wanted, that would nourish them. That way... They would not have to worry when they go to the event and the event doesn't serve their kind of food. They already ate. They're already full. Can I preach this for a moment? Yes? All right. Wouldn't it be great if we could all live our lives that way? What do I mean by that? That before you can come into any situation in your life, any event, any gathering, any meeting, any endeavor, any project, you wouldn't show up in that situation hungry, but you would be filled up. And I'm not talking about physical hunger. I'm talking about being filled up with the, with the good ingredients. God's love, God's peace, God's hope, God's encouragement. So that way, when temptation comes knocking on your door trying to come in and sell you something you would have the power and the authority to say I'm sorry but I'm not interested in what you're selling me because I already ate I'm already full come on see that's how you fight temptation from the get-go when you see temptation coming in the only way to fight temptation in one of the beautiful ways is you got to be filled with the spirit you got to be filled in Christ. Everybody say, fi be filled in Christ. Because the devil knows better than to fight someone who is filled in Christ. That's how Jesus resisted all three temptations. Because he knew who he was. That he was the son of God. And that he knew the power that was coming from God. So he never needed affirmation from somebody else. Because he already received it from the Lord. 
from his father and I tell you when you know who you are in God when you know your place here on earth you're not gonna be tricked into buying what the devil is gonna sell to you why because I'm already filled everybody say that I'm already filled Thank you so much for watching. If you like this video, don't forget to click the like button and tell people and all your friends and family about the inspiration they can receive here. And remember to subscribe and click the bell icon so that you get notified when we're going to upload the next inspiring video.